Hi, my name is Paula Garcia and I'm going to present the following topics. The use of the personal electronic devices on aircraft, Wi-Fi services on aircraft and electronic flybacks. The use of the cell phones and the related wireless technology has become essential nowadays. But what happened 50 years ago? In 1963, the Federal Aviation Administration and the European Space Agency published the first regulation which states that the, the use of the personal electronic devices have the potential for causing interference with aircraft radios and other electrical and electronic systems. In that year, the rulemaking was inspired after the 1958 and the 1961 studies of PEDs interference, which conclude that the portable frequency modulation radio receivers cause interference to navigation systems such as the VHF or mid-range navigation system, which is the board. The electronic interference to aircraft was the most common argument for banning the PEDs, so that's why in 1990, the NASA made a report that says that the avionic problem that may result from the, inf the, from the influence of passengers' electronic devices may be in some way true. These devices may interrupt the normal operation key cockpit instruments, especially the global position system. Later studies carried out by NASA in the following years support the idea that the electronic devices dangerous produce interference in a way that reduced the safety margin for critical avionic systems. On the other hand, there was no definite instance of an accident known to have caused by an electronic device. Even though there was no recorded accident caused by the interference of the personal electronic devices, the doubt was still there. That's why in 1991, Boyd also investigated several cases where the aircraft crew reported that the autopilot disconnected and commanded aircraft rolls or instrument display malfunction. The aircraft manufacturer was never able to replicate the reported anomaly in a laboratory test. However, it turns out that the ban of the wireless devices has a lot more to do with a possible interference for ground network rather than any other danger posed to aircraft systems. So the Federal Communication Commission banned in flight use of most of the cell phones and the wireless devices cities in the reason of ground network interference. Later on, in 1992, the Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics studied the issue of electronic devices on airplanes and they didn't find interference and recommended allowing the use of the electronic devices, it, but still it suggested the precaution of banning the use of any and all devices during the critical phases like the takeoffs and the landing. That year, the EASA published the regulation of 1992, which states that an operation shall not permit any person to use and to take all the responsibilities to ensure that no person does use the personal electronic devices on board an airplane that can affect the performance of the airplane system and equipment. The next studies were carried out in the year 2000 by the British Aviation Authority, which established that when the mobile phone were used near the cockpit on any other avionic equipment, they will access the safety levels for all the equipment. Therefore, the report concludes that the current policy which restricts the use of the devices while the engines were running should remain in force. On air, a company which is owned by Airbus and Aeromobile, which is owned by Telecor, are each proposing the use of PicoCell system in an aircraft cabin to connect the calls via satellite to a designated global ground infrastructure whilst preventing all other cellular communication to the ground in order to prevent the interference with the ground stations. Due to that reason, in the year 2006, the FCC and the EASA decided to re-examine their ban on in-flight use of PEDs and they decided to permit the airborne operation of the wireless handsets and any other devices under the following condition. The device operates at its lower power setting under the control of a picocell, which is a very small specialized cellular base station installed on board the aircraft and second the operation does not interfere with on ground users. Next action were taken in the year 2011 when the FAA modernization and the reform act of 2011 was adopted as a public law. It says that the Federal Aviation Administration should make a study on the impact of the use of the cell phones for void communication in aircraft during a flight in a scheduled passenger air transportation. This section directed the study to include a review of the foreign government and air carrier policies on the use of cell phones during the flight, a review of the extent to which passengers use cell phones for void communication during the flight, and a summary of any impact of the cell phones during the flight on safety, the quality of the flight experience of passengers and the flight attendants. Finally, last year, the FAA and the EASA announced that after performing recommended tests, airlines could safety span passenger use of personal electronic devices during all the phases of the flight. Internationally, more than 40 jurisdictions has authorized the use of mobile communication services and has successfully operated without causing harmful interference to terrestrial commercial wireless network. 
that's why the International Aviation Organization purpose narrow restriction on airborne use of mobile devices in 800 MHz cellular and specialized mobile radio bands, replacing them with a more comprehensive framework encompassing access to mobile communication services in all mobile wireless bands to harmonize the regulation governing the operation of mobile devices on airborne aircraft across all commercial mobile spectrum bands and also add the authority to provide mobile communication services on airborne aircraft across all. Finally, both the European and United States Civil Aviation Administration have purpose rules that will give airlines the ability to allow passengers to use their mobile wireless devices to communicate with the cellular frequency equipment while flying. But it will be the airline's decision in consultation with their customers whether to permit the use of data, test or voice services. Now we're going to talk about the Wi-Fi services on aircraft. It could be said that in-flight Wi-Fi is now accessible on around 40% of the U.S. flight with companies like Lufthansa or Emirates. As the airlines are beginning to install the Wi-Fi system in their aircraft, some requirements are being imposed. For each model of aircraft, a Wi-Fi system is to be used on, so the operator must get a FAA operational approval based on the FAA certification or a ESA certification in the case of the European flights. The approval includes testing to show the equipment that the equipment performs its intended function and does not interfere with any other aircraft system during all the phases of the flight. However, there are significant problems. The connections are often slow and unreliable, and the prices can be half, perhaps $20 usually per device. But the great problem with the Wi-Fi is how you connect with the ground, and there are two main routes that companies may take. One of the pioneers is the U.S. provided GoGo which has built a network of 3G ground stations all across the country, and the planes communicate with these as they fly overhead. It's a simple system, but bandwidth can be limited to a little as, as little as 3.1 megabits per second, and that's for the entire flight, not per customer. The American company is now rolling out its 4G technology, equipping the planes with dual modems and directional antenna that will increase the bandwidth to a theoretical maximum of 9.8 megabits per second. The problem is when a plane flies out the sea. As it is obvious, an alternative is under research. The alternative, the alternative approach is for each plane to connect via satellite. The telecom company on air it's, uh, takes a particular convenient approach. On air offers the choice of GSM and Wi-Fi, so the passengers turn on their phones and just like international roaming, the costs are included in their bills. In the case of using the Wi-Fi, they will have to pay according to the airline's own rules. The main idea is a broadband direct air to ground communication system, which constitutes an application to provide various types of telecommunication services such as internet. The connection with the flight passenger uses terminal on board aircraft is to be realized by already available fix or Wi-Fi based on board connectivity network and or via GSM on board aircraft. The final topic of this presentation are the electronic flybacks. One of the main ideas in the aviation industry is to, to have access to the right information at the right times in order to enhance operations. And the electronic flybacks helps operators to move forward, offering innovative solutions for a fully digital fly desk. But what is an electronic flyback? It's an electronic device that allows the flight crew to perform a big amount of function by reducing the paper-based material. It can compute basic flight planet calculation and provide a huge variety of digital documentation, including navigation chart, operation manuals, and aircraft checklists. The most advanced flybacks are, are, uh, are integrated with other aircraft systems as the flight management systems. Devices which function as an electronic flyback may refer as an auxiliary performed computers or as a laptop auxiliary performs compute computers. Electronic flyback can be separated into three software types and three hardware types. In the hardware types, we have the class one. This type it does not require a national aviation authority approval. Uh, the hardware is a commercial of the self based computer system that is portable. This class is usually without the aircraft data connectivity access under specific conditions. The second type requires a limited airworthiness approval. It can, it can exchange data with the aircraft system in order to make interactive uh, performance calculation. It is connected when in use to an aircraft mounting device during the normal operation. Moreover, it is capable of quick disconnection for egress if necessary, and it is considered for regulatory purpose to be a controlled PED, allowing it to be connected to the aircraft avionic. And the third time is not as an installed equipment 
and they have to fulfill their working requirement and must be under, under the design control. This kind of hardware is subjected to a limited number of requirements for non-essential equipment, typical grass safety and conducted and radiated emission testing. Then, talking about the software classes, we have the Type A. It is the most basic software which provides electronic documentation as flight manual but no navigation charts. Type B, it provides all the information from Type A, but it can also displace approach charts, calculate the weight and the balance, and provide weather information. And the Type B, it includes the, the information from the two previous types, but it can also displace, displace on seat position, on approach and airport charts. But what is the minimum size for an electronic flyback? They should have a minimum screen of approximately 200 mm measured diagonally across the active viewing area. A smartphone is not appropriate or acceptable as an either primary or backup service. What approvals are required for the use of the electronic flybacks? An approval with only will require if the device is attached to the aircraft extractors. Operators that intended to use the software application for weights and balance will need to have it validated by a weight control authority. A very important question is, what is the legal requirement for a backup um, to electronic flyback? A backup is always mandatory. The pilots must have the latest documents for an approved venture readily accessible. It is the readable accessible requirement that prompts the need for a backup, and all the pilots need to ensure how they met the requirements in the event of the tablet malfunction. But is a tablet a legal device? An electronic device such as another table is an acceptable backup. Private pilots can, tab uh, can use tablet devices as a primary means of in-flight documentation as long as, the, uh, as long as the documentation is from an author authorized source. Another requirement established by the Federal Aviation Administration according to the Class 1, Class 2 and Class 3 said that they may act as a substitute for the paper manual that pilots are otherwise required to carry with them. The PEDs used in Class 1 and Class 2 configuration must meet the rapid test compression testing requirement. Any data connectivity of the PEDs uses in the Class 1 and Class 2 configuration to the aircraft system shall be performed in accordance with a supplementary type certificate, type certificate or amendments type certificate. The requirement established by the FEAA and the EASA says that the display of the on seat position on the ground must meet the requirements. The display of the on seat position in flight is prohibited on Class 1 and Class 2 configuration. So, nowadays devices such as iPads are being used as an electronic flybacks. So, the critical question is, are iPads legal for aviation use? The definition of legal depends on what type of flying you do and what you are using the iPad for. The iPad app are legal replacement for the paper chassis in the cockpit, at least for the most part of the 91G flying. The 91G flying, they are referring to the operation in piston or to grow props aircraft with a mass cross waist less than 6,000 kilos. In addition, the Apple uh, manufacturer uh, has listed its international battery safe certification according to the Federal Aviation Administration. So thank you for your attention and you, I hope you enjoy it.